All right, take your Bibles this morning, if you would. Let's, let's get to something uh, a little bit more productive. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. After reminding the Corinthians of the, the, the pagan and idolatrous lives most of them had lived, Paul gave them two tests. We looked at it at the end of our, our time together last time. One was negative, one was positive for determining if a professing Christian is truly saved uh, and, and, and out of that paganism, and if that, he says, uh, is what the Holy Spirit would have him to say. If God himself, who gives right understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ to an individual believers, and who gives oneness and power to the church. Now, we've been walking through the book of 1 Corinthians. We know that the Corinthians were behaving in response to the flesh rather than the spirit. We know that because we have already seen the following. They quarreled, they became contentious, they took each other to court, they fell back into immoral and idolatrous practices, uh, they corrupted marriage relationships, they abused the Christian liberty, they became self-centered, they became overconfident, and they were worldly. Their misunderstanding and misuse of spiritual gifts is, was a major result of the fact uh, that, that the church was permeated with carnal divisiveness. Understand that the Spirit gives gifts, that's abilities for spiritual ministry to believers to express and strengthen the unity that they have in the Lord Jesus Christ. But to misuse those gifts shatters unity. It divides believers. It ruins their testimony before those who are on the outside, and it short-circuits growth and effectiveness in ministry in the Lord's service. Paul, no doubt, had taught the Corinthians carefully about spiritual gifts when he ministered among them for a year and a half. Amen? If you know Paul, and you know he was there for a year and a half, this is not an area that he simply glossed over. But they had forgotten and or perverted much of what he taught. And so he now reiterates, reinforces what they should have known. In the passage that we're going to look at this morning, the apostle explains that the Spirit gives a variety of gifts to be used in a variety of ministries that have a variety of effect, but have a common source, and a common purpose. So we begin this morning by looking at the variety of gifts. Now, you have your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse 4 with me. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Diversities or varieties. Now, it's, it's interesting, when you get into this topic of spiritual gifts, one of the questions is, is there a difference between spiritual gifts and talents? And I'm going to just cut to the chase and say yes. And then I'm going to explain it to you. Okay? I'm not going to just leave you, leave you hanging. Natural talent, skills, and abilities are granted by God just as everything else good and worthwhile uh, is a gift from him. But those things that are natural talent shared by believers and unbelievers alike. An unbeliever can be a highly skilled artist. An unbeliever can be a highly skilled musician. An atheist, an agnostic can be a great scientist, a great carpenter, a great athlete, a great cook. If a Christian excels in any of such abilities, it has nothing to do with his salvation. Though he may have used his natural talents in a way to bring glory to God after he is saved, he possessed them before he became a Christian. Okay? And, and so here's, here's the thing. Spiritual gifts come only as a result of salvation. Spiritual gifts, then, are not natural, rather supernatural, given by the Holy Spirit, and always to those who are believers in Jesus Christ without 
exception. Here's a good working definition uh, for spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are the special capacities bestowed on believers to equip them to minister supernaturally to others, especially to each other. All right? Some of you are taking notes. I'm going to give you a second to jot that down. Consequently, if those spiritual gifts are not being used or they are not being used correctly or rightly, the body of Christ cannot be the corporate manifestation of its head, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the work of God is hindered. If this is our working definition, that spiritual gifts are special capacities bestowed on believers to equip them to minister supernaturally to each other, and especially to each other, <coughs> then if we are not doing that, we are not fulfilling what God has called us to do. And the work of God, therefore, is what? Hindered. It's hindered. Essential to this unity is a diversity. You say, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Well, unity of spirit and purpose can be maintained only through diversity of ministry. But unity is not uniformity. Now, I don't want to get lost in the minutia here, but think of it like this. A football team whose players all want to be quarterbacks would have uniformity, right? Everybody wants to do the same. Everybody wants to be the quarterback. They have uniformity. Nod your head like this. Okay, so I know you're not. I, I'm tracking, all right? They may have uniformity, but they do not have unity, what would it look like if 11 guys ran out of the field, balls on the ground, and they all just lined up behind it? Yeah. You'd say, well, that's the, the goofiest thing I've ever seen. Absolutely. There is a, 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 uh, no unity there. There's uniformity, but no unity. It could not function as a team because everybody is trying to play the same position. That's Paul's point here. God gives his people a variety of gifts just as players on a football team have a variety of positions, and every position is important. Even down to, is it the left tackle or left guard? Which one protects the quarterback's blind side? Tackle, left tackle, all right? Most quarterbacks are right, they drop back to pass, they turn their back, and it's the guy over here who's got to block the incoming defender or the quarterback's going to get crushed. You say, well, you know, who ever heard of a, a, of a great lineman? You know, who really cares about linemen? Man, we want to talk about quarterbacks and receivers and running backs. Every person on that football team has a job, and when the job is done and executed correctly, the team can be successful. Amen? The same is true within the local church. I mean, what would it look like on a Sunday if it came time to preach and we all came up here and stood on the pulpit. <laughs> stood up here on the platform. Wouldn't that be, you know, wouldn't that be great? Now, I, I realize there's some of you, my wife's back to no, because you wouldn't want to get up in front of people. I understand that. God's people, or excuse me, God gives his people a variety of gifts, just as players have a variety of positions. Diversity or varieties is a Greek word that basically means apportionments or allotments or distributions with the idea of variety. Aren't you glad we're not all the same? Wouldn't Christianity be awesome if everybody was just like me? Okay, maybe not. God distributes his gifts in many forms, in many varieties to his children. He has a multiplicity of gifts which are given to every believer. They fall into two general categories. They are speaking gifts and they are serving gifts. 1 Peter 4.11 reminds us, Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak through God himself who's speaking through you. Do you have the gift of, of helping? Do you have the gift of helping others? 
then do it with all your strength and energy as God supplies. Let everything you do bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. The New Testament contains several lists of the categories of spiritual gifts. One of those is here in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, and then verse 28. Scholars, Bible scholars do not agree on the exact number and distinction uh, of kinds of gifts because of all the spiritual gift lists in Scripture, there is not one that is identical. There's not one that's identical. And it seems clear that God did not intend to give his church either a rigid or precise and exhaustive compilation, but rather general categories. Now, a word of caution. One should be careful not to overdefine gifts because they may resist classification. There is not much value in, in taking tests, formal or informal. I, I am not a big fan of, uh, of getting one of those spiritual gift survey things and trying to figure out, you know, what your spiritual gifts are. Uh, I, I just, I, I'm just not a fan of that. A believer's gifts can be overlapping. It can be a combination of things taken in different proportions from one category or another. One person may be obviously strong in a particular gift, such as teaching. Another may not be as strong in any one, but have a measure of three or four. It is best to see each person's gift as a unique blend of the categories of giftedness granted to the individual in connection with his or her traits, experiences, and the needs of the church. Each believer becomes as spiritually unique as the fingerprints are physically unique. There is not a one of us that is gifted exactly the same as somebody else. And that is the way that God has designed it. Everybody that is a part of the body brings something to the church. Everybody. Let's talk then, uh, we've talked about variety of ministry. Let's talk about the, uh, the variety of gifts. Let's talk about variety of ministry. Look at verse 5. There are differences of ministry, but the same Lord, God gives his gifts to be used in a variety of ministries. Even Christians with the same basic gift may be led to manifest that gift in different ways. One teacher may be especially gifted in teaching young children. Others may have a special ability with original languages and be highly qualified to teach in seminaries. One evangelist may be powerful to address a large crowd, while another strength is one-on-one -on -one ministry, one-on-one -on -one witnessing. One person's service of teaching may emphasize exhortation, doctrine, while another may focus on comfort and mercy. The emphasis here is on variety. Not everybody can do the same thing the same way and be effective. Amen? I have the privilege of, of, of being a part of special camp. And it is amazing to ask people to come and speak and they can't do it. It's hard. There are times when you just have to flat be silly. There are times when you may be required as you're preaching to act out a particular scene in the scriptures. That works at special camp. A lot of guys, a lot of guys can't do that. I've asked guys, would you be willing to speak at special camp? Not my area. Can't do it. 
There is nothing wrong with that. Amen? Amen. Not everybody is cut out for every ministry. Somebody who is a good teacher may not make a good preacher. Amen? Teachers are different. Some are excellently qualified to teach adults. Not so much little kids. Some do an excellent job with little kids and want no part of teaching adults. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad, again, that we're not all asked to do the very same ministry? Ministries, the word itself, is from the same basic Greek word that we get serve, servant, or deacon, one who serves. Spiritual gifts are not given as badges of privilege or prestige, but tools for ministry. <coughs> Excuse me. Spiritual gifts aren't given so that, you know, Dave can come to me and goes, yeah, I got spirit, you know, I got spiritual gift of humility. Yeah, that's right. I don't really think that is a spiritual gift. I had a friend of mine text me this week, and, and he said, uh, what are your spiritual gifts? And I said, confrontation, argumentation, and friendliness. Those are my, <laughs> my spiritual gifts. Uh, you know, and um, he said somebody in his church one time told him he thought his spiritual gifts were wrongness and, uh, and uh, what was it, oh, criticism and wrongness. So, uh, you know, some of, those, some of those don't fit, you know. And uh, uh, so the, the spiritual gifts are given so that we can do ministry. The Lord gives them to his servants so they can serve and he gives them for a limitless variety of services. All gifts are for services, but the type of service is immeasurable. Amen? We gotta, we gotta understand that. It is critical to understand that spiritual gifts are not given for self-edification. Never are spiritual gifts given to edify the individual. A teacher who studies the word writes out lessons that he only reads or keeps messages that he only hears is, is, is falsely using the gift that God has given him. A person with the gift of discernment who keeps spiritual given insights to himself is an unfaithful steward. God's gifts are not for self-service. A Christian with the gift of helps must, by definition, help others. Amen? I mean, it doesn't make sense. I have the gift of helps. What do you do? I help myself. That, it, it doesn't work that way. God gives his gifts to us, but for others. We are stewards of God's gifts. Here's the phrase that you need to get in your head about a lot of stuff. You ready? God is the owner. I am the manager. God is the owner. I am the manager. I saw that lived out so well in a friend of mine's life. He um, had a Chevy Nova back in the day when we were going to college. And if you know anything about college students, about half the time their cars are broken down. But for some reason, this stupid Nova ran all the time. And, and we, would, we would borrow his car. We would, we would just go and get his car. And, and I would say, Mark, I am so thankful for you. Let me use the car. And he, and he would say this. He'd say, Steve, it's not my car. God is the owner. I am the manager. And if I can let you use it, praise the Lord. Amen. That's what it's supposed to be. God is the owner. We're the manager of all the stuff that we have. True? See, now, preacher's starting to meddle a little bit. Because some of us got some cool stuff. And we're not really sure we want to be loaning our stuff to anybody else. 
God is the owner. We are the manager. The gifts that God gives us are loaned to him. Guys, they belong to God. They're not ours. They're for us to use, but it is his power for service and for his glory. Each one of us has a gift which is unique, single enablement for God to use in his design by his grace so that we are uniquely prepared for service to Jesus Christ. And how do we serve God? How do we serve Christ? By serving one another. It sounds so spiritual to say, I'm saving my spiritual gift to serve the Lord. Well, I got news for you. The Lord expects you to use your spiritual gift by serving others within this particular body as a start. Okay, variety of gifts, variety of ministries, variety of effects. Verse 6. And there are diversities of activities, but in the same God who works all in all. The Greek word translated here as activities in the New King James is also translated as effects in the New American Standard. It literally means working out or energized. The one who provides spiritual gifts also provides the energy and the power as well as the faith to make them effective. Again, notice it's not about us. It's not about our natural abilities. It's not about our natural talents. It is about God's enablement, God's empowerment so that what we have from God and use with each other, it's effective. That's what spiritual gifts are for. That's what spiritual gifts are about. Spiritual gifts are given supernaturally and they are energized supernaturally. Christians, no matter how well trained and experienced or how unselfishly motivated can exercise their spiritual gifts within their own power. They may exercise talents, skills, intelligence, other natural abilities in their own power, but the giver of spiritual gifts can be the only one who empowers that spiritual gift and allows it to be effective. Amen? You're not sure. Yeah. Just as God gives no commands for what he for which he does not give the ability to follow and obey how many times have you ever heard somebody say god never put you in a place where he hasn't got the grace to, to sustain you anybody ever heard that god never put you in a place that he doesn't have the grace to sustain you god never gives a gift that he doesn't have the ability to energize Both granting and empowering are the Lord's exclusive domain. Self-made, self-made Christians are an absolute contradiction. Can't be. Can't be. Like the gifts themselves, the energizing of spiritual gifts is sovereignly varied. In other words, the same gift may be used by the Lord in countless ways in various ministries. We should not all expect to have the same gift, nor should we expect them to operate in exactly the same way or produce the same quantity of fruit. Again, God's people and God's gifts are like snowflakes. Every single one is different. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that, 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 that we're, we're, there's a diversity amongst God's people? That's a good thing. The emphasis here, <clears throat> excuse me, the natural man, the carnal person, however, is more concerned with uniformity than unity. Let me, let me, explain, let me try to explain it this way. In their immaturity, in their carnality, the Corinthians tended to be superficial copiers. They were more interested in appearance than substance. And they tried to copy the gifts and practices that seemed to get the most attention, that seemed to be the most um, 
successful, popular, powerful. Like many Christians today, they like formulas for solving problems, formulas for success, and even formulas for doing the Lord's work. The Corinthians were more interested in being successful in spiritual gifts than they were about being submissive to the Lord. They wanted to be noticed and praised more than obedient and faithful. That is why they highly valued the more uh, dynamic gifts such as speaking in tongues. They were not concerned about using the Lord's gift in his power to serve his church, but in using them for their own power and selfishness and draw attention to themselves. You understand that? Now take a look at the day and age in which we live. Most of the use of spiritual gifts, the biggies, I'll say it, you ready? Speaking in tongues, the emphasis is all about, look at me, look what I can do. I'm special. More worried about standing out than submission. Our first and foremost concern should be to discover and to faithfully use and to be grateful for the gift that the Lord has given us. Now, let's, let's draw this to a conclusion in, in, in this, that there is one source and one purpose for these gifts. Look at verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each for the profit of all. The phrase here, manifestation of the Spirit, restates what Paul has emphasized in each of the three previous verses. God is the source of spiritual gifts. They are given by and are manifestations of the divine trinity. Gifts are given by the same Spirit, verse 4. Ministries are assigned by the same Lord, verse 5. The effects are energized by the same God, verse 6. Manifestations has the basic idea of making known, making clear, making it clearly evident, if you will. That is what spiritual gifts do. They make the Holy Spirit known. They make Jesus Christ known. They enlarge the name of God. That's what they are for. The meaning of manifestation is the opposite of hidden or private. Spiritual gifts are never to be hidden, never to be used privately. They are to be given to manifest the Holy Spirit, to put God on display. These verses are also given for the profit of all, for the common good, literally meaning to bring us together. The term also came to mean to help confer a benefit, to be advantageous. In the context of this verse, it means mutually beneficial or advantageous. Here's the deal. Spiritual gifts are to be edifying and helpful to the church, to God's people, to whom he brings together in his name. Or look at it this way. Not only does the exercise of our spiritual gifts minister to others, but it also helps them to better use their spiritual gifts. For example, one who faithfully preaches and teaches to his congregation not only builds them up spiritually, but prepares them to be better stewards of their own spiritual gift. God may use that pastor for the equipping the saints of the work of the ministry, through the building up of the body of Christ, Ephesians 4.12, in the same way, a Christian who ministers the gift of helps, not only serves other believers, but encourages them to be more helpful. The one that has the uh, gift of mercy helps his fellow believers to be more merciful. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 talks about the comfort with which God comforted you. You comfort others so that they can comfort others with the comfort that God comforts them with. Change out the word help. If God has given you the gift of help, help others so that they can learn to be able to help others. So that they can learn to be able to help others. Whatever it might be. 
whatever it might be. But on the other hand, if we fail to minister with our own spiritual gifts, we hinder the ministry of others. Do you realize that? Do you understand that when you say, I will not serve, I will not do this, that you are hindering perhaps the ability of somebody else to follow hard after God and to use their spiritual gifts. A Christian who does not exercise their spiritual gift cripples their own ministry as well as the ministry of others to say nothing about forfeiting the blessing and the reward that would have come to their own lives. So let's close with this. When the church ministers its gifts as it should, there are at least four important results. There's four important results. Number one, Christians themselves receive great blessing, both from exercising their own gifts and from exercising uh, of, of others' gifts for their benefit. Hopefully, when you sit under the preaching and teaching of God's word, and I, I believe that God has given me the, the, the gift of preaching and teaching and exhortation, and so I preach and I teach and I exhort you to use your spiritual gifts. That ought to be a blessing to you, and then you ought to be out blessing somebody else with whatever gift God has given you. Maybe God's given you the gift of hospitality. Maybe, uh, Ron, well, I'm going to pick on you for a second here. Maybe it's the gift of running a smoker. You know what God's people said? Amen. If you've eaten anything wrong made in the smoker, all right, okay? You say, wait a minute. Anybody can run a smoker. But what do you do with that? Are you blessing somebody with it? Are you using it as a ministry tool? You see, guys, God gives us these opportunities, and what a blessing it is. It's a blessing. God never intended the ministry of his church to be carried on by a few professionals or talented men while everybody else just sits back and watches. I hear that. that I heard it again this weekend. I was, I, was, I was somewhere and I was with a bunch of guys and I had a guy come up to me and he goes, you know the problem in the church today is? And I said, what's that? And he goes, 10% of the people are doing all the work while 90% are sitting around doing nothing. And I don't know if I should have done this or not. I said, well, quit your squirting and crying and go to work. Be a good example. Whoop. Quit crying about it and go to work. Pull somebody alongside of you and show them how to minister. Work with them. Encourage them in the use of their own spiritual gifts. Wow. What a shocker. Right? That's what we ought to be doing. Number two. When everyone does their part in ministry, the church forms a dynamic witness and a power and an effectiveness it could not otherwise have. Not only are those with the gift of evangelism empowered to witness and be more effective, but every believer is used directly or indirectly to strengthen the testimony of the gospel before unbelievers. So I'll share the results. When Peter preached at Pentecost, 3,000 people came to know Christ. And when the Jerusalem church, including all of those new converts, began to faithfully and sacrificially exercise the spiritual gifts, here's what scripture tells us. The Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Everybody was involved. Everybody was involved. Number three. When the church ministers its gifts, God's leaders become apparent. In a faithful, functioning church, spiritual leadership inevitably emerges. Capable leadership is essential for the church to operate as it should. But a faithful church is also necessary to provide an environment in which leaders can develop. 
and lead as they should. Part of the ministry of our local church is to look amongst ourselves and say, are there men who are good leaders? Not men who are popular, not men who are rich, not men who are attractive, like there's any of those, not men, you know, that, that fit the world's view, but men that it's almost obvious God's got his hand on them. They love the Lord. They love his word. They love his people. They love the church. And they're desiring to see that growth. Not only the men, but the young men. Do we look amongst our young men and look for leaders? Look for those who would be at least available if God was to call them to full-time ministry. You know what we spend most of our time doing with our young people in church? We're a bunch of knuckleheads running around. Well, that, that kid, God do some of them? Pfft, are you kidding me? In a way, I wish y'all could have known me when I was a junior high kid. Because you went, seriously? <laughs> I'm going to tell a story on my wife. We graduated from college and went to Illinois to minister. And uh, there was a, a, a pastor and his wife that were very, very precious to us and had a huge impact in us even going off to Bible college and that kind of thing. And uh, Lynn had grown up in this church. The, the, pastor, the, the pastor's wife had known Lynn since she was, frankly, a snot-nosed little bus kid. And I remember walking into the National Conference when it was held downtown Des Moines. And we walked into a ballroom, and probably what, 25, 30 feet away, I heard somebody say, Oh, my word, Lynn Cox, I never thought you would end up being a pastor's wife. Whoa! How many times do we look at the kids, even within our own congregation, and go, that one numbskull? Are you kidding me? When we minister our gifts correctly, God's leaders become apparent. Here's the last one. Number four, a church that faithfully uses its gifts in the Spirit's power, experiencing the joy of great unity, love, and fellowship in ways that no amount of human ability, planning, or effort can produce. When the church is functioning properly with all of the people doing what they're supposed to do, there is great unity, and there is great blessing, and there is great growth. And all God's people said, Amen. Father, thank you this morning for the opportunity to have opened your word, to once again delve into this topic, laying some basic groundwork for the use of our spiritual gifts. Father, we know that you are doing a work in us. God, we know that you are gifting us. Father, help us to be faithful in using our spiritual gifts, not to our own edification, but to reach out to others, even within our own assembly, and encourage them and help them to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, even to the use of their own spiritual gifts. Father, help us to be that body. Father, we belong to you. Use us as tools in your hands. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your